just wow, wow, wow is all I can say. En bref, I'm loving middle March so much. It's so good. Let me just finish my gushing and then I'll talk about sort of the things if you want to avoid it. Hi everyone, it's me, Jess. Welcome to my channel if you are a new subscriber. <laughs> I think I have a few new people. Thanks to Scott for shouting me out in his video where he talked about booktubers' favorite books. He has been a longtime supporter of my channel, so very grateful to him and to all the other subscribers and booktubers. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to talk about the books that I read in July. And I just want to make a special mention because I'm feeling very good about my progress. Some of you who've been around my channel for some time will know that I have been trying to read Middle March for a couple of months, I think since April when I started reading it. But look, guys, check it out. I am reading it at on a schedule, at a giving it a pace. And I decided that pretty quickly, I think after about the first 10 chapters, I decided that I really wanted to annotate a little bit more closely Middle March as I was reading it. And I really don't think it's taking away from my reading experience. In many ways, I think it's adding to it. So really be curious to see what people think about annotation. I am going to do a proper wrap up of Middle March when I get to the end of it. And I think I'll probably just do a standalone video, which I almost never do. But for Middle March and because of my annotations, I think it's merited. So more to come on that. So funny, so interesting, so well written, such great characterization. Just, it's so good. But I will gush about it in another video. So yeah, spoiler alert, I'm loving it. It's going to be a positive review, but it'll be a deep dive. So you can look for that soon. Are you gonna say hi to everyone or just stand there staring at me? So other than that, because I've been spending quite a bit of time on Middle March and because I read another very big chunky book this month, I've got five books to talk about. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Milk Fed. Oh, Milk Fed. Hmm. <laughs> This book, I, mm, what do I want to say? Okay, I'll start just for those of you that don't know what Milk Fed is about. Milk Fed is by Melissa Broder. I haven't read anything by Melissa Broder up until now. For anyone who hasn't read this book and who is considering reading it, I think it's fair to say off the bat that you should proceed with caution if you have any experience with eating disorders. Trigger warning, if you have any experience with disordered eating, I can say, you know, be careful going into this book just because the protagonist of the story, Rachel, has a, a, a dysfunctional relationship with food. And that's maybe putting it mildly. She, we start off learning about Rachel as really the main element of her character is this very messed up relationship to food. She counts her calories and she restricts uh, her food intake and she's trying to conform to a very thin body requirement. The mother in the story this is put mostly on the mother in the story although i think it's important probably if, i think it would have helped to have had some context of society just thinking about my own experience growing up and my own relationship to food and my daughter i have a daughter and thinking about her relationships to food and how i've tried to manage that around her i think we we can't forget and I think it's I think the thing about this book is that although it's good in many ways and darkly funny it just doesn't deal with I don't think it deals with some of the topics that it raises as effectively as it could and I might be in the minority in that position but I it troubled me a bit the way that this book uh, presented these issues. So I think unfortunately, you know, most of the blame, blame is put on the mother. Now Rachel is Jewish and so there's a lot of commentary also on Jewish families and Jewish 
mothers. <laughs> there are two Jewish mothers in this book. And I just, I don't know, I don't think, I think it's a bit uh, flat or a bit two-dimensional in that we don't really see as much. There are a few instances where societal impacts uh, come into play. Like, for example, she goes regularly to buy yogurt at a yogurt shop and the server at the yogurt shop gives her a hard time for her order because she's not indulging in sprinkles. And I think that that's fair because we are living in a society that's very, that, that, that imposes a lot of shame on people who do not, are not health, that don't manage their diet in a very specific way, who are also fed by a capitalist system that encourages us to eat disgusting amounts of what isn't really food. So, None of that is really addressed in the book. It's really more focused on Rachel's personality and her relationship with her mother and her mother who definitely, by by anybody's assessment, has given her a standard that she's meant to live up to around her body and the way her body looks. So at the beginning of the book, Rachel is seeing a therapist and the therapist tells her or advises her to go on a detox from her mother. So that's the premise of the book. So Rachel's detox from her mother leads to kind of the, it's like the effect of like the, the horses out of the gates. So it leads to her freeing herself from a lot of the restrictions that she's placed on herself in terms of her eating. At the same time, in parallel, she meets a woman who actually works at the yogurt store that she frequents, who she becomes quite obsessed with, and who really is presented as a kind of a sex object. This woman, Miriam, is also Jewish, but her family is an Orthodox Jewish family. Miriam is not concerned about calories. She approaches her life based on enjoyment and pleasure. To me, Rachel kind of, Miriam represented everything that Rachel wished she could be but was not able to be in terms of how she was around her relationship with food. She also just became like a, a kind of a sex object to Rachel, which I just had I had some trouble with I just I, get, I think it the hedonism that came with the, the the sort of the gates being open she decided to include this sexual indulgence with this woman Miriam I kind of wish that it, it was a little bit more fleshed out there were just things I think that didn't get enough attention. Miriam's character didn't get enough attention. She wasn't a very well-rounded character. We don't really know very much about her except for what she represents to Rachel. And there's a lot of sex in this book, so I don't know. I mean, I don't have a problem reading about sex, but I found it to be quite... I found the food descriptions and the descriptions of sex were very, very repetitive. And so initially I thought, oh, I'm loving this book. It's so darkly funny. It's so, it's so good and it's making so many interesting comments. And then about 100 pages in, I just started to feel like it was extremely repetitive. I had a hard time connecting with Rachel's character. I, I don't know how to feel about it because I feel like it, it's... Hmm. Yeah, I'm still thinking about how I feel about it. It's definitely not like one of my favorite books that I've read <laughs> at all. And I will say that at one point, because Miriam's family is Orthodox Jewish, at one point there is a conversation that they have about Zionism around the dinner table, around the family table in Miriam's home. And it just, it's like, it brings up all these really important political topics. And maybe it's just meant to represent kind of what happens in the Jewish community when there's a difference in opinion around Israel and Zionism. But it just doesn't really give it the attention it probably should have. And I just, I don't know, it was left very unresolved. It was kind of like, oh, you know, if you're anti-Zionist, then you're, you, you can be anti -Zionist. I think to me it was like, you can be anti-Zionist. If you're anti-Zionist, then you're an anti-Semitist. And all of that question just wasn't properly, ugh, just wasn't properly dealt with. I wish it had been better dealt with. I just don't know why she would bring up the question of the Zionist issue for Jews without, like, why bring it up unless you're actually going to make it 
I don't know more part of the story. I don't know. It just really bothered me. There was like a lot of things that bothered me of the, the way that certain issues were dealt with in this book and the way that they were kind of not dealt with. They were raised, but not really resolved and not really dealt with. And on the one hand, I understand that not everything is resolved. Obviously that's not an issue that's resolved, but I think it's kind of, I find it annoying to bring up something complex like that in a book and not actually include any commentary on it really but I guess maybe that's the commentary anyway <laughs> and I did tab a lot in this book because I tabbed sort of all the funny bits and all the love bits but I went back and I was looking at the places that I tabbed and I didn't there was nothing there that I actually found funny the second time around so it wasn't terrible it wasn't a waste of my time but it really wasn't as much as I was hoping it was going to be I participated in Jane Austen July and this year I read Northanger Abbey I will post a link to the video from last summer where I read Persuasion so the two Jane Austen books that I've read were Persuasion which I loved and Sense and Sensibility which I really didn't like and honestly put me off Austin completely. Like I didn't think I would want to read anything of hers. So Persuasion kind of saved her for me. And now I'm re rethinking Austin. I, but like I'm reading Middlemarch and Middlemarch is far superior. I realize that there are different types of books and they're for different types of readers and they, they're serving a kind of a different, they're scratching a different itch you could say. Not to compare, I think comparing can be a little bit tricky. Reading Northanger Abbey was a really good idea for me because I'm a bit of a sucker for a coming of age story and I've already read The Italian by Anne Radcliffe so I had a good reference for what the this book was making fun of. So for people who don't know about Northanger Abbey, it was one of, it's it's generally one of the least liked Austen books, I think along with Mansfield Park. Those are kind of the two bottom Jane Austens, Pride and Prejudice being like the top. I'm not even sure if she finished it. I think it might've been published posthumously, but I'm not sure. You can let me know in the comments below if you know. The protagonist is a 17 year old girl named Catherine who is just really into gothic novels. In particular, in this story, she's reading The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. And she imagines herself to be the heroine in these, you know, the heroine in these gothic novels is often kidnapped and there are all these really dramatic things that happen, or at least in the Italian, the heroine was kidnapped, uh, the one that I read. I haven't read The Mysteries of Adolfo, so I couldn't refer specifically to that storyline, but I think that Jane Austen is poking fun at that author in particular. So Jane Austen is obviously kind of presenting something different than just the story in this novel, which I thought was interesting and different and fun. And maybe that's why Jane Austen lovers don't like Northanger Abbey. But as I said, I'm a sucker for a coming of age story. Catherine is invited by a neighbor to Bath on an extended holiday, or she makes friends with Isabella and John Thorpe. And she also meets Henry and Eleanor Tilney. And they're, these are interesting characters. Isabella in particular is a really interesting character to me. I thought she was interesting. She is engaged actually to Catherine's brother and then she has a transgression. And so I thought that that was pretty, maybe a little bit different for the time, but she's not a very likable character. But there's nothing wrong with an unlikable character, right? It makes it kind of more interesting and but I think a lot of people have an issue with Northanger Abbey because they feel like the other characters in the book aren't very well developed. And maybe that just has to do with it being like one of her last books. I'm not sure. But I thought the most interesting and fun parts of this novel, aside from it being quite funny and aside from the coming of age aspect, which I enjoyed because Catherine goes through these friendships and well the first part the first half of the novel she's in Bath and then in the second half of the novel she's invited to Northanger Abbey by the Tierneys um, to go and stay and of course Northanger Abbey is this big castle and it really represents kind of these abbeys that she's been reading about in Anne Radcliffe's books and her imagination kind of gets the better of her and I won't go into too much of that part of the plot. I think there's too much time spent in the first half of the book in Bath and I think that's how she kind of keeps you reading to get to Northanger Abbey and find out sort of what happens there. At the same time she does use that 
part of the book to the narrative starts to discuss the the novel and really defends the idea of the novel and there's a lot of discussion about novel reading amongst the characters uh, because Catherine is such a massive fan of Anne Radcliffe and in particular as I said The Mysteries of Udolpho. Now Jane Austen has the narrator really talking about how great novels are and how wonderful they are and, and I guess as a means of escape but they're sort of presented as being dangerous too because they can feed the fire of the imagination and you, know, you can make mistakes and assumptions and come off as being fairly silly and that's exactly what happens to Catherine. I don't think I'm giving any, anything away by saying that. So in that aspect, it has a coming of age element because Catherine really learns through her experiences. <laughs> who, who, what, what's, you know, when you're taking something too far in your imagination, letting the imagination get the better of you and maturing out of that. And then also she learns a lot about friendship and who your friends are. And she really learns a lot about real life through the process of the story. I just, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really funny and I liked what it had to say about the novel. It's kind of like the way we look down in a snooty way on people who aren't reading literary fiction or aren't reading the Booker Prize or aren't reading the, not necessarily the Booker Prize, but you know, the lauded books that are reading romances or whatever people were reading for Garb August, sci-fi, that sort of thing. And I, I just thought it was fun and it surprised me. It wasn't what I was expecting. So I did really enjoy Northanger Abbey. Jane Austen is now, <laughs> I think those are probably going to be two, my two favorite Jane Austen's Persuasion and Northanger Abbey and Persuasion I really love. Maybe I'll read Pride and Prejudice next year. Following from that, I read Patchwork by Ellen Banda Aku. This was for the uh, Women's World Cup Readathon. They drew names for people to read books by different authors representing the different teams that were playing and I was assigned a Zambia and there weren't that many choices unfortunately for this and I managed to find this in my local library. It's called Patchwork. Oh, I already said that. It won the prize for African writing in 2011. It's also a coming of age story for somebody in completely different circumstances than Jane Austen's uh, protagonist. Obviously, it really explores poverty and class in Zambia. So it's told by our protagonist, Pumpkin, who is unfortunately She's not abandoned, she's not an orphan, but she's definitely neglected by her parents. Her parents are no longer together. Her father is this kind of gigantic figure who is no longer with her mother, but is remarried to a woman who is kind of domineering and very religious. And her father also has a mistress. So her father comes to take her to live with him at a certain point because her mom is an alcoholic and he decides that she would be better off living with him. But in that household, she's sort of unwanted child in the sense that his new wife and him have other children. So in many ways, Pumpkin just isn't able to really find her place and she's neglected so she starts to really behave badly so the main character is just a really emotionally sort of stunted girl who just behaves extremely extremely badly like she does a lot of really unsavory things and she causes a lot of issues and problems for her family it's kind of like she's just seeking negative attention and takes things too far and she's quite unhappy that's the main part of the story uh, and then the second half of the story follows Pumpkin as an adult and we see that it carries through into her adult life, this kind of bad behavior and that rejection as a child has also caused her a lot of problems as an adult. I don't know, I, I, it was just a very, it wasn't so much dark as it was just a very kind of, a kind of a bitter take on human beings and but you do get a lot about the culture and you do get a lot of insight into kind of the way women are in the culture and the way women are treated in the culture. Uh, but ultimately it was kind of a downer. It was quite a downer and I, I just, 
had a really hard time with Pumpkin, her character, and I think you're supposed to. So that's what I read for the Women's World Cup. I got a little confused about the draws. I think I'm supposed to, I was supposed to read something from Spain, but I thought I was supposed to read something from Japan, so in the end, <laughs> this is all I read for the Women's World Cup readathon. And I'm glad it got me, it gave me a chance to explore something from somewhere I normally wouldn't read. Like I normally would never have picked up this book, but it wasn't, I didn't love it either. I did not love this book. <laughs> it was okay. So the next two books, I love. First one I'm going to talk about is Migrations. I actually kind of last minute unwrapped this. It was in my wrapped TBR and added it to my TBR for July and just happened to be something that I picked up and then couldn't put down. This book is so good. I'm surprised I haven't heard more people talking about it or maybe people on booktube were talking about it in bookstagram and I missed it. This is the story of Franny, our protagonist, who is following the migration or what could potentially be the last migration of the Arctic Terns. It's set I guess in the near future and I guess it would be referred to as climate fiction. It's really my first time reading something that is really I guess climate fiction. Well maybe not because I did read Burnham Wood and I did read The Overstory. I have to tell everyone I had to put this book down like three times, more than three times because it was so, I was so upset. <laughs> it made me cry, it choked me up. I don't know if it's just where I am in life. So in that way it's quite an intense book. It was a lot more intense than I thought it was going to be and it has a lot of twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. This was definitely a ride I wasn't expecting. What a great book. Just okay, so we follow Franny who is an ornithologist. She herself has had an incredibly tragic life. So the book goes back and forth from the current day to the past and we start to learn more about Franny's past as we go and it, it is revealed in little bits and chunks and we don't know what it is that happened in her past to put her where she is following these arctic turns and really the character of Franny is a character who seems to be extremely traumatized, extremely troubled. She's really running from herself but of course she can't get away from herself. So she seems to be just trying to escape her past and we know that bad things have happened in her past. So her life really is heartbreaking and she's a young person and she's had a really heartbreaking life. So it's very character driven. So she convinces a group of fishermen on a boat called the Saguenay to take her to follow the arctic turns with her and she convinces them that if they follow the birds then they will find fish because the birds will be looking for fish and so it does deal in part with the fishery uh, they end up getting uh, stopped because all fishery is banned because the seas have been overfished so it deals with all these little elements of climate protection and climate change and she has to kind of reconcile her relationship with these sailors who are fishing for a living to her goals as a climate researcher. There's a lot going on in the book but it's also just a really compelling story about a person's life and the way that she deals with the tragedies in her life. She is a creature of nature. She's very strongly connected to the ocean. The story goes back and forth between her past in Ireland and takes us to Newfoundland to the lives of the families of the fishermen. It's very political when it comes to the fishery specifically and climate change and then it's also about her own very tragic life story and I was really impressed. I really was impressed with this book. Just didn't see it coming. One of those that just kind of came out of left field and took me by surprise in a really good way. So this is a really interesting part of the book where she's talking to the fisherman about the fishery. She says, don't you, why don't any of you seem to care about what you're doing? Of course we care. It used to be such a good way to make money. He folds his arms, lets that sink in, and then he stops it off by saying, and it's not us, you know, global, warm, global warming is killing the fish. I stare at him. Aside from also fishing to excess and contaminating the waters with toxins, who do you think caused global warming? Come on, Franny, this is boring. Let's not talk politics. I can't believe him. I really can't. And then it's like standing at the bottom of a mountain. I have no way to scale and I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted by Basil and his small selfish world. And I'm exhausted by my own hypocrisy because I'm just as human and just as responsible as he is. And so in the end, I slump back in my seat and close my mouth. 
So like this is a, an idea of what, what she does with the writing and how it's it's pulling in the issues of uh, climate change. Depressing a little bit. <laughs> She also writes in another section as a part of her past when she visited, visits Yellowstone National Park. She writes, I found my way to Yellowstone to one of the last pine forests. It is an empty place now, not as it once was. The deer have all died. The bears and wolves went long ago, already too few to survive the inevitable. Nothing will survive this, her husband says, not at the current rate of change. There is no bird song as I walk among the trees and it is catastrophically wrong. I regret coming here to where it should be more alive than anywhere. Instead, it is a graveyard. It's definitely <laughs> a warning <laughs> in many ways. And, but anyway, it's still, Franny is a great character and it still really sucked me in. And I just think it's a really good book and I really enjoyed it. And I would recommend it for sure if you're interested in that sort of thing or those themes. So good. So, so unexpected and so good. I'm really glad I read it and I'm really glad that I got her other book because I think I'll probably enjoy it too. I think she's a really interesting author and she's doing some interesting things with storytelling. So the last book that I'm going to talk about is a book that I asked my viewers to vote last month at the beginning of July when I presented my TBR. I did present a few choices and one of them, that uh, the one that, that got the most votes was our Share of Night by R Marina Enriquez, which is kind of cool because she's Argentinian and so therefore I'm in translation as well. This book would fit if you're still looking for something to read for women in translation. And when I made my video about women in translation, I recommended this book. I hadn't been, I had read only the first section of this book and it sucked me in so well. I was so invested in the characters right from the beginning and I actually think that the first part, so the book is divided into different parts and they're big chunky parts and they don't have any chapters in the sections in the parts. So you really have to be prepared to like, the, the whole idea with this book really is that she is taking you into a, she really wants you to be submersed into this world. She does such an amazing job of creating the atmosphere of this story and so it's a family saga it's a political drama it's a scathing takedown of the elite uh, if you look at it as a commentary on colonialism and elitism and people in power and their the way that they oppress others and keep others oppressed and the way they treat people who they feel threatened by I mean it's it's amazing it's such a good book it has various different levels right so the story opens with Juan and Gaspar. And Juan, and Juan is Gaspar's father. And Juan has the ability to speak to or commune with the dead and commune with what is referred to in the book as the darkness. And he, we, we believe, he believes that it's possible that Gaspar has the same ability. So that is the setup. And then from there, it's m mostly about uh, about Juan trying to prepare Gaspar for his future life and to protect him from being exploited for this ability in the way that he had been exploited for the same ability by a cult called the Order. So Juan became a tool of the Order because of this ability to to kind of transcend uh, human abilities of consciousness. And so he becomes a, a tool of the order and I guess also a tool of the darkness through the order. And he, because he became a tool because he was very young and had a heart condition. And when he, when he was saved, the people who saved him were part of this cult, the Order, and they ended up controlling him and using his abilities to maintain their power. Juan falls in love with this primary family of the Order's daughter, and they get married, and that's, they have their son, Gaspar. So, the story is also told, so it's told in different time frames, like it starts out in 1981, and the connection between this family and the order and the politics of the time is made. And so then it's not a very big stretch to start to think about this family and the people in power in the family and who are fighting for control of the people 
well, Juan and potentially Gaspar, the mediums, as representative of, of political powers or the political elite or the societal elite. So that parallel is made very well. And just the lengths that the family will go to to maintain their power and destroy the lives of their kids in the process and take lives in the process and just really, they're brutal. That's really the plot. But the book goes through different time phases. Like I said, you start out in 1981 and then it goes back in time to 1960 and then it goes forward in time again to the 1990s. So it goes back and forth in time at different phases of different stages of Gaspar's life and different stages of his father and mother's lives and tells the story of how the order began how Juan became a tool of the order. And it really takes you into the world, this very dark world of this cult. And I think there are parts of this book that you could say this section is more historical fiction, this section, like written more in the style of historical fiction, this section is written more as a true thriller, this section feels more, and Willow talked about this if you want to check out Willow's review. There are sections that reminded Willow of different horror writers, which I thought was really interesting because I hadn't, that hadn't occurred for me in the same way that it did for Willow. But I will say that there's a section in the book that's set in the 60s through to the 70s that is told from the perspective of, yeah, so Gaspar's mom, Rosario, it's told from Rosario's perspective, the section from 1960, and I think that that was my favorite part of the book. It just captured this, it's set at a time when they were all in uni together in the UK, and it just had that, as Willow said, a very dark academia feel to it, and I think that was my favorite part of the book. Although I will say, the whole book is really, really, really good. I don't normally read something that has that is so fantasy. I'll read horror, but I, I've never really read a lot of fantasy and I don't usually have the patience for fantasy. But this book is so well written. So the world of the order and the family saga that, it, that you're drawn into very quickly is so well conceived and so detailed and so atmospheric. It's built on such dark elements and the order and the members of the order that are in power are so evil that you are uh, you're really on not on edge but you it just the atmosphere is so fearful you know that the main characters are in danger and that they may never not be in danger so she's able to create that atmosphere where and I think that that's where it's such an interesting parallel to the political, like where it's such an interesting parallel to think about what she's saying about people living under an oppressive regime and under oppression in general, is that you're just that feeling of constantly being vulnerable and constantly being afraid, constantly being potentially trapped and used, which is what she's really saying, like this idea that the oppressed <clears throat> are used by the elite to maintain their power, which is exactly what they're trying to do, which is exactly what they did with Juan and exactly what they're trying to do with Gaspar. It's also exactly what's happening to people who are oppressed in our society because of being, because of the color of their skin, because of their social standing, because of the elite. So it's, it's pretty, it's really, really astonishing, this book, honestly. It's just so dark and so evil, and you know that the characters are in danger at all times. And then on the other hand, you have all of this world building and all of these characters, and you have these really tremendously savage horror scenes. It's so dark, and it's a cult. Like, it's just, I don't know. There's too much to say about this book on the one hand, and on the other hand, you just read it. Now listen, there are people who do DNF this book. A lot of booktubers who I respect have DNF this book, and I think they have their reasons, obviously, but I think a lot of it has to do with either it's just not the genre for them, or it's that it, it does get a little bit cumbersome in places. I would totally agree with that. I think that it has that effect because it starts off so strong and it's so quick at first and then it backs up 
the pacing in this book is odd. Like it backs up, it slows down. The pacing and the style of the writing changes from the different sections and from the different periods of time and the different voices, which on the one hand, if you're open to it, it's quite interesting. On the other hand, I can see how that would annoy people or that people would give up on it, which is a shame. And then the other thing, the last thing that I want to say about this book is that in the beginning of the first section, she quotes from another book called The Invention of Morel, which I've never heard of and never read, by Adolfo Bioy Casares. I hope I'm saying that right. She quotes, I believe we lose immortality because we have not conquered our opposition to death. We keep insisting on the primary rudimentary idea that the whole body should be kept alive. We should seek to preserve only the part that has to do with consciousness. So in that way, <laughs> And that's what the order is trying to do. They are trying to achieve immortality through the powers of Juan as this medium who is able to, the idea is that that power of extended consciousness can live on through Gaspard and live on forever and create mortality if it's controlled. And that idea is, so that idea in and of itself is so interesting because it's really also this commentary, I think, on, and I need to read this book, obviously, because that's where the idea originally came from, but this idea that we don't need the human body for consciousness to continue forever and ever and ever and ever and become immortal. And that is so much an important idea today with AI. Like, maybe I'm making a connection where there's no connection, but to me, I really saw this connection also to the notion of AI taking over the world. <laughs> so I, which is just on my mind these days. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Maybe it has to do with going back to school. So for those of you who are new, new to my channel, if you've made it this far in the video, I'm a teacher and I've got to go back to classes next week. So... Yes. So anyway, I definitely highly recommend this book if you like horror, if you like family drama, if you're interested in political horror, if you're interested in dark academia, if you're interested in like occultish stuff. This is such a good book. I'm so glad I read it. And I'm so glad I took the time to, to do it because it needs a bit of time in the sense that at first it was very fast and then it got a bit slower, but slow books are my game. I can do that. I'm happy to get immersed in a book and I'm happy to get immersed in a book book. And so definitely up there for me. One of the, one of the really, one of the best books I've read this year and highly recommend it. Okay. I'm done gushing. <laughs> So yeah, if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching and shout out to uh, my new subscribers. I did a call for questions in a short. I'm not sure if that was the right vehicle for a call for questions. So I might post again in the community page or if you want to put a question in the comments below, I'm going to be doing a Q&A video in celebration of hitting the 500 subscriber mark. That's it for now. I'll be back soon. Bye. reading this author and <clears throat> what did I like about this book? I think that the book, okay, well, trigger warning. <clears throat> oh All right, let's try this again. I seem to have still the remnants of this cold. This won't go away. I'm just coughing, hacking. So great. Sniffling, coughing, hacking, frog in my throat. Okay. This is very specifically tied to a point in the future where we are seeing really the, the loss of, the greater loss of our planet and, um, okay, now I'm not making any sense. So I guess it's not my first time reading about, about a climate fiction book. Anyway, what's an ornament's oldest? Ugh, so many turns. I learned so much.